Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I have to disappoint you. I didn't bring a garage to open up. Um, but uh, the talk is remotely related to garage to openers because um, the garage to open is one of the simplest um, machines that is controlled by, by PLC. Um, who knows what a PLC, what a PLC is? OK, at least a few. Um, who had programmed a PLC? Well, OK, oh, even one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so let me start by how I got there. Um, I'm, I'm using mainly Alan nowadays, Alan and C mainly, um, and I use it uh, in embedded system settings. And I started doing this um, while I built the predecessor to this device, which is a flashing device for the car industry, uh, for mass reflashing of ECUs. Um, so I needed to implement a lot of protocols and. Uh, in this device, um, the, the airline was still running on FreeBSD on a separate motherboard, and um, on the gateway there was uh, operating system running, or kind of operating system. It's actually executive because it's not, it's, it's running, it's, you link everything to the operating system. RTEMS runs on the gateways, which translate um, the USB signals that go from the mainboard from Alan to the actual ECUs, to CAN bus, MOS bus, and whatever interfaces you need in the car industry. But the actual protocols, so the gateways are actually stupid. It's only queuing going through, going back. Um, some optimizations if you need a quick reaction, like stuff that needs really to be real time are in the gateways, and uh, the, all the automotive protocols are implemented in there. So, but I, I thought it was like having Alan and the, and the and the deeply embedded operating system so separate um, is kind of limiting the, the stuff we could do with it. So I ported Erlang, the Erlang um, virtual machine, um, to the Atoms operating system, which is a hard rhythm operating system. Um, this is called the GRIS project. Um, there's a website which is not very active, which uh, hopefully will get more active once I release the stuff, because this will be the, the port will be released. But <coughs> Uh, currently, it's still entangled with some customer code, and I need to disentangle it a little bit and clean it up, and then. But I'm, I'm not sure if I promised it the same thing the last year. I will, I will release it until the end of the year. But I didn't say which year. So um, a short overview of the of the Artem's operating system. So I already told you everything is linked together. Um, it can run on very small hardware. Uh, of course, then you can't run Erlang on it anymore, so you need like a medium-sized hardware to uh, run Erlang on it. It has hard real-time behavior, so um, with the current system, we can implement the hard real-time stuff in C, and on top of it, everything that's more dynamic, uh, you can implement in Erlang. Um, which is actually a good thing to have, because um, Especially, I mean, the, the, the productivity in a functional language like Erlang um, is much higher than in like the traditional programming language, imperative languages. Um, the difference um, shows even more if you're doing embedded stuff. Because in embedded stuff here, normal compile load link cycle is quite tedious because you often have, you have to load over a JTAG interface and it's very slow. Um, after I did the port and I, implement, I implemented the the, the airline distribution, so I can have a remote shell into the node. Um, one, I, was, I was working on some kind of driver, and uh, at one time I, I noticed that I didn't reboot the system for three days. And okay, so normally I would like reboot it every five minutes, because normally you write some C code, you load it with the debugger, it crashes, you try to find out why, and then repeat forever. So. Let's move to um, the, the application. I'm, um, these boards are, that I'm showing today are made for. Um, this is um, not for, not directly for the automotive system, but for uh, manufacturing. Um, it's uh, basically the the predecessor of this system was a, a RFID system that was also built with, with RTEMS. That's how we like thought we take RTEMS again. Um, initially, we wanted to like extend this a little bit, but uh, it worked out differently. We rebuilt the whole system, and so this is a proprietary RFID system for transport systems um, in industry. I'll show you some pictures how this stuff looks. It's, you have you have pallets moving around. There are sensors, and 
this is a, a, a thing that goes up like mechanically and stops the thing. And there are ribbons here and they move continually. And so you can have multiple pallets on it and you can, with these things, you can separate them and stop them and, and fix them. And that's, that's the whole area of uh, application, like transporting stuff in the factory from one process to the next. Um, this is currently done in, uh, in a research project um, that's um, providing some of the funds for this. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that you wanted to have that these transport systems are very individual. Usually, sometimes you have like modules where, where we have like say a corner or stuff like this. But often you like build it customly for the customer and then you have to adopt your mechanical control stuff, um, like how long does do you wait from the sensor to the stopper and whatever. All this stuff needs to be adopted um, um, in practice and I don't want to do it. Because otherwise um, I'm sitting in, in, in factory floors and fiddling with the system. Um, I don't have time for this. So we want um, to, 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 to enable the, the people who traditionally do this, the PLC programmers, to program our system. So what this talk is actually about is a soft PLC um, which runs on top of the Erlang VM um, on these small boards. So let's go back a little bit PLCs. Um, PLCs, programmable logic controllers, for those who don't know what it is, um, it's a kind of computer that is used um, in mainly in industry, but also like for garage door openers, for a very small one, um, which um, usually control real-time stuff, or more or less real-time stuff, but stuff that needs, um, where you need a lot of um, like powered IOs, where you move stuff electrically, like the whole, basically the whole factory is run on PLCs. It's the PC of the factory. And there's a whole, there's a whole um, world of programmers who program these PLCs, um, which are very busy programming these PLCs, uh, which use completely different uh, uh, programming languages from us, and where, where there's almost no overlap with, um, with like, let's call us normal software developers. Probably they would disagree. <laughs> um, so I find it kind of interesting to have these, um, that they're, they're, they're not, not like uh, Erlang programmers and Clojure programmers and C++ programmers, but they are totally, totally separate set of programmers which don't, we actually don't talk usually. I talk to them because I like need the input. Um, <coughs> so these PLCs um, 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 are kind of standardized. Um, there are a bunch of standards. Um, so you can like run the code from one PLC on, from the manufacturer of one uh, PLC kind on, on the others which kind of works um, because some big companies, I'm not, not saying any names, um, uh, usually there, there is one big one that, that dominates the European market and there's another big one that dominates the American market and they have their own standards. Um, so they, on all the smaller ones that, uh, that are also in the market, they are behind these um, standards. The IEC 61131, that's for the classical PLCs, uh, basically everything, and there's a new standard, um, well, of which we will hear more for distributed PLCs. So, how do we program these? You see, they come in all kinds of sizes. You usually, they have lots of I.O. Sometimes they don't have visible I.O. They only have like a panel and some push buttons. Sometimes uh, you only see the I.O. and see nothing else. Um, so, how are they programmed? Um, yeah, well, that's how it started, basically this kind of diagram. Because the PLC was in invented, I think it was invented for Ford, because um, in their first factories and in the 1950s, they had the problem that every time they had to change something in the process, um, everything was controlled by basically relays, time, time delay relays, and they had to bring in the electrician to rewire everything. And um, so they wanted to have a more flexible way to like rewire their process. And, that's how their, their first language, they, they, they are very fond of graphical languages, so the first language is basically the, uh, derived from the diagrams that the electrician draws when he uh, builds, builds relays. So we have like, this is a coil of the relay, 
and that, that's a switch. And basically, if this coil gets current, the switch closes. And the current runs from left to right. So this is basically if you if you push the switch, if, if this is a sensor or a switch, if you push this, um, then this gets energized, then this gets closed, and it keeps on industrial start stop. Um, then next they had a like assembler like uh, language. Um, he, by the way, this is still in the, in the standard, even the relay stuff, and it's still used. Because some people like this. For certain applications, it's a nice way to program the stuff. Um, in the same standard, there is also a Pascal-like language called Structure Text. Uh, it has a Pascal-like syntax, um, where you have, like, yeah, you can see it's Pascal-like. <laughs> and um, there's other similarities. And there's also a graphical version of this. Um, you can basically write the function blocks here. Well, basically, this is the, the graphical code for this, in, in this case. And um, usually, you have a mix. You have more complicated stuff that's more, more feasible for writing like a, an actual program, because it's too complicated. There you have a program, and then you put it in a block like this. And, and then you, you arrange the high-level blocks uh, you just rewire for configuration. There's also a sequential function card, that, a chart that's uh, derived from Petri nets, that's basically that's transitions, and it's a kind of state machine, so if this state is active, and this uh, condition uh, gets activated, um, then it goes to the next state, and you can have like the diverging and converging transitions, so both states, and yeah, we, that, that, that's, uh, that's mainly the, 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 the highest level in IEC 6.11.31. So for the non-distributed PLCs. But non-distributed PLCs are kind of boring. And because we, we are using Erlang and have, have ways to do distribution, um, we were more interested in the distributed PLCs, with, which actually fit better. The, the compute model of those fits better for bringing it on, on, a, on an Erlang machine. In a distributed PLC, um, these blocks you saw before, um, are uh, augmented, they have a head now. So what, what you have now is like IOs, that's, that's input variables, that's basically parameters, that's the output of the, <coughs> of the block, and you have, can have multiple inputs, multiple outputs, um, that's quite usual. Here we have only one output, and in addition we also have events, and the events are the stuff that goes in the, in the head, the headed events to the normal stuff, because the normal, I, have to, I, I forgot to, to mention that, the normal PLCs, the way the code runs is the code is run in a cycle. There's an implicit loop over the whole code. And if your code gets too complicated, the cycle gets slower, so it doesn't, get, it doesn't react fast enough, and then you need to buy a bigger hardware. That's about it. It's only cycles. Global variables cycles are very messy. And <clears throat> for distribution, this won't work anymore, because you can't like, translate these cycles very well to on, on the wire <coughs> and the global variables. So they added events, and now um, the blocks don't run in cycles anymore. They don't run at all. They only run when an event comes. So if, if an input event triggers, then the code here runs, and the output event is triggered after the code is run, or while the code is run. And these events are connected to the inputs and outputs, um, which means that these inputs are only valid if this event comes. That's an important thing to do because otherwise you would have like to to still pull the, the, the data values. So the data is connected to an event, and this is um, only valid um, when when the event actually triggers, which makes it um, quite feasible to map this on messages, which is what I did, of course. <laughs> Basically, an event plus associated data is a message. <coughs> Let's look how this, uh, how the code actually looks. Um, only shortly, um, you have um, the code starts over there. You have like a function block. It's called Vota. This, it's basically the code for this, for this block. Um, you have some input events, and you have the, the second input event, the vote event. You can see um, it has a with statement. That's basically the connection to the data. And then you have output events, also the with statements. Then you have the actual input and output data, and then we need some code. Um, there is an, an implicit state machine in these blocks, so we have to specify our states, the ready and loaded state, 
um, associated with the stages is, 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 is a piece of program, a piece of algorithm, it's called the algorithm, um, um, which runs when the state uh, is entered. So every time we go into a ready state, the reset algorithm is entered. And the thing after the error, um, that's, that's what happens um, uh, when, when the reset algorithm run, then the ready output event is triggered. So here we, we specify which input event, no, no, we, did, we don't specify the input events, that's the next thing. We specify just the states and what runs when, when we enter the states. The transitions, um, um, they, they have the input events. Basically, you have transitions, state transitions, it's basically a textual state transition diagram. So we have this state goes to that state, and the, the, on, on the right end, uh, it's, it's, it's an input event which triggers this. Um, we, on, on the right hand, you have, can have com complete guard expressions. You can have, a, have basically an event combined with, a, with, with some Boolean expression on the variables. And you can even leave off the event. And this doesn't trigger by itself, but it, the, the stuff that, that's, that's triggered without the event can be triggered by a different event. Uh, because these are like triggered, uh, they are uh, searched by priority, like the topmost is searched first. And also, after a transition is, is gone in the state machine, um, then we again go to the through the transitions when, when we are done with the, with, with the state. It goes through the transitions and then we don't have an event because we already consumed our event. And then everything that has, has an event can also trigger. So um, then here we have the algorithms. The voter is basically a majority vote. That's a block that's, that, that's in all the beginner's books of, of these PLC stuff. So I just took it. People seem to need this stuff. And, in, in, in PLC applications. Um, so before we dive deeper in how I actually bring this on the other machine, I show you the application. Um, that's actually, you see over there, you see the, the, the red loop. Huh? See the red loop here? So it's the same boards, and they actually, this is a transport system, and that's, that's only this corner, that's how we started. Like this summer we had this corner, and it's the first actual demo to the to the management um, where we showed this and we have okay. so this pallet goes here it's a very simple program we do it stops here and it's detected by the sensor and after five seconds I think it opens the thing and it goes on and it actually stops the motor so it doesn't fall off here and is it? there you see the boards that we have here show them more later so in the meantime, um, they have a, basically a loop where they run in circles and try stuff out with different algorithms. Uh, this is part of the, the loop that is shown. Um, so this is, this is going on right now there. This is going on 24 hours at the moment. That's like in a big hall where all these machines stand where we try out stuff. So the next slide is the same. Sorry, skip over it. So how, how did I bring this on the on the LMVM? How over time? Half an hour, that's very good. Um, if if you install an uh, Erlang OTP, what you get with this is basically all almost all you need. Um, you get a uh, lexical analysis thing, the Lex with double E which is basically looking like, if you know Lex and Yak, you can use um, the, the Erlang versions. Um, we, they have basically the same syntax. The only difference to the C versions of Lex and Yak are maybe, does everybody know what Lex and Yak is? Yes? So Lex is lexical analysis, and Yak is a, is a parser generator. And um, in the Erlang versions, you, you, you can actually just write Erlang code in there. In there. Attributes, and, which is quite convenient because um, if you if you build a compiler in C, then you have to write a lot of management code, like symbol tables and stuff like this. And if you are on a higher level language like Erlang, functional language um, with higher order functions and stuff like this, it's much easier to write a compiler because you don't have all this management code, and then you can have like uh, higher order functions that traverse your your abstract syntax tree and modify stuff and you can have very 
very tiny passes over there in the, in the compiler. It's, it's very convenient. And <clears throat> what I, after this process, what I actually generate, because um, uh, I want the code that I, uh, that, that, that's written by the PLC programmer to actually run on the Erlang VM, together with the rest of the stuff that we develop. Because there's lots of other stuff going on. There's the RF, RFID reader going on. Um, we have um, a distributed cache um, of the RFID contents. Uh, in, in, in the network, we have uh, we are planning to um, do um, online planning, AI optimization of the factory stuff. This is all done now. I mean, the whole routing stuff is, is normally done by PLC programs. They actually write routing algorithms in PLC. It's crazy. It's really crazy. So what we do is we, we do only simple things in the PLC stuff, just like move the parts, and all the high level stuff we, we, we keep in there. And so since we want to have to, we want to run it on Erlang VM, we somehow want to um, produce Erlang code. So we could like generate Erlang code, but there's actually something much much nicer inside the Erlang compiler because inside the Erlang compiler there's a hidden in internal language which is called Core Erlang, um, which is a much simpler functional language and uh, which very simple scoping rules where you have let. Basically, you have let this in that and in that and that. So you have very clear scoping because the scoping in Erlang is kind of, I wouldn't say it's weird, it's complex. Weird. <laughs> uh, it's, I, yeah, it's weird, okay. <laughs> um, so it's uh, much easier to generate this code, um, but um, so there, there are some challenges um, generating like uh, code for an imperative language in, into a functional language because, for example, if you have an if statement and you have like two branches and a, let, let's say I set a variable before the if statement so it has a value already and then in the if statement uh, only one branch I change the value and afterwards I still use the value. So if you want to like transform this in a, in a functional language it doesn't work anymore because it's like you have to think about what, what, what you do. So you could basically have to, everything that's after the if statement you have to put into a known function basically and pass the stuff as parameters. But uh, what, what I did is I, 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 everything what's after the if is in its own let. And I need to find out w which, which path through the, th through the if statements modifies which variables and these get parameters to this let. So I, I can transform the imperative and, the, uh, and this stuff to the functional stuff. This loops is similar basically. You generate the loop and you generate a function for the loop and then make the tail recursive, tail, tail recursive call. Quite similar like um, the list comprehensions are compiled, are also compiled to an internal function. So let's look a little bit like the compiler, how the compiler is, is built up. So it's a, a little bit simplified. Um, there is on the left, maybe I need my pointer now. So over here, no, I'm not painting. Over here, oh, I painted already. Um, that's the compiler driver. Um, these are the passes. First we scan, then we pass. That's the generated stuff by the parser generator and scan generator. Then we have um, a bunch of um, small passes over the abstract syntax tree, transforming stuff a little bit, and then I produce core error. And at the end, all I call is basically from the compiler, from the other compiler, compiler, I compile from core. And so you can the the the, the core Erlang stuff you can normally you produce just uh, the syntax tree of core Erlang, but it has, has actually a syntax you can pretty print it and you can look at it and I if I have time I'll show you some core Erlang. Um, so then we need a runtime and so I have to talk a little bit about um, the ST files are the actual source files. Um, the Bota ST file is the one I already showed you. And uh, slightly different colored ST file, there's another um, kind of syntax for the ST file where you do the connections. So basically, they're, they're connecting the inputs and outputs of different function blocks. There's also a syntax for this. But usually, you can write it as a syntax, and I did because I, I don't have a graphical tool yet. But normally, this you do in a graphical surface thing. And, and we will add this. Everything, there will be an IDE which will be better than the current IDEs of PLC programming stuff, which is not hard to do because the current IDEs really suck. Sorry about if somebody who probably nobody here will build this, uh, these tools. Um, 
So the, 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 the application, basically, where everything is wired together, is um, compiled uh, slightly different and has a different runtime than um, the, the normal blocks. So the normal blocks um, is basically, there's an there is Erlang behavior module where, where uh, the, the, actual, the actual server loop that goes on. So every function block is mapped to Erlang process. Since the Erlang process is so lightweight, we just don't care. We don't have to just run them asynchronously. Which has some extra challenges because you really notice that the people who wrote the, the specification for these languages, they, they are not thinking asynchronously. They are still thinking loops. They are still thinking, how do we translate this on our loops? Oh, forever running synchronous loops. So it's interesting. Yeah. But I think they, they, they won't like where, where, the, where it gets them. Um, so this is actually the server loop, and um, this is the callback module that's generated by the, by the, by the compiler. And the, the application thing is a little bit different. There's a, there's a di different behavior that calls into this. And also the, the supervisor um, calls into the, to the application module to find out which function blocks it actually needs to start, because all these processes are, of course, um, supervised. So talking about supervisors, that's how it looks when it runs. We have um, the, 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 the green stuff basically is pre-written Erlang code. That's, that's code that's in the runtime system. And uh, the reddish brown stuff are the, the ST source files and for, for normal function blocks. And um, the, the slightly brown one is the application function block. Actually, this is the bean file generated by this. I just wrote it, yes? What does ST stand for? Uh, the, the name of the language is structured text. Ah, okay. Uh, shortcut ST. Yeah. And so it, there, is, there is no standard file extension, so I just kept it. Um, so what happens is basically when, there, when, 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 the, when the supervisor, uh, usually here is also the, 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 call, the, this is also the callback module for the Erlang application, for people who know how Erlang applications, Erlang applications are a piece of code that has some servers um, associated to it and which you can start and stop. And the starting and stopping is going also over this uh, generated code here, um, which then calls the, the generic uh, runtime supervisor which calls back and like asks it. Um, so what do, what do I need to? I, what, I, what, what kind of function blocks do I need to start? And then it starts all the function blocks, the actual callback modules, which then call back into the the blocks. And there's also a special case on the left, because sometimes you can't write, you can't or don't or, or, or don't want to write um, the the actual implementation of a function block in ST because it's not possible. For, for example, for the delay is not possible, actually, because I can't have a delay in ST. I need a delay blocker external. And this is actually the, this is the standard runtime delay block here we're using. And, uh, so there's a, a different way to specify it. So you have an ST file to specify the interface. So everybody can look at the ST file and still knows what's the inputs and the outputs. And then there, instead of the algorithms, there's just a, a statement which says this is implemented in Erlang, and the actual callback module is this one. And that's the, the Erlang module that's, that's, which needs to uh, observe a different behavior um, from the other thing. Um, all the function blocks and the application are, are special processes, so they are confirmed to all OTP rules, so they can be put into supervisor trees as you want. Oops. Not what I wanted. There is one slightly problem. We we have an event and the data connected, and we move it as messages. And when we do, when we have a, a situation like this, where the event output and the, and the data output, oops, sorry, uh, when the event output and the data output goes to the same target function block, then I just send a message from here to there. But it is allowed to have stuff like this, so that the event goes through another block, and then goes back into this block, and the data goes directly. So then I, I need to make sure that this event never arrives before the data. I mean, if I look at Erlang semantics, if I am on the same machine, um, that actually can't never happen, because if, if the, one, one, the, the one message goes through another process, 
Um, this one will always, always arrive synchronously. But um, we are talking about distributed PLCs. So we, we, we don't know in which machines these function blocks are. So we need to make sure that always the data is there first before this event, differently. There's a, a simple solution to it. Um, basically, what, what I do is I send the data first, and I send it synchronously. So I, I wait until I get down, and the answer that the data arrived, and then I send the event. This is um, not too efficient. Uh, sometimes you need to do this because it's um, the, the path, the, the event goes is too complicated, and you just need a fallback that always works. Um, there's a different way. Um, if you analyze the, 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 the connection graph of the thing, then you can find out that if we would just move the data through here, then we can just part, then everything is together again. The events and data are to get together again. And for cases that are simple enough, where the, the cost is simple enough, which are very often, most of the cases are simple enough that you can actually find out, okay, I move the data along and then uh, I basically add a virtual input and output that goes just through. And then I can just use simple messages. So, I mentioned distributed uh, PLC. If we want to have a distribution, we need to make sure uh, some other stuff. Because when we distribute over the network, um, we have these things called net splits and, and node downs and all, all kinds of fun that happens, um, which goes in the way of the stuff just working. And so we have basically uh, uh, two nodes, left and right, and we have. Um, both we have this supervisor tree, and you see this blue box. There's an, an additional process added to the to the supervisor uh, as last as last ch child. So every every function block is started first, and then the, the monitor block, the PLC monitor block. And the supervisor is actually currently it's a one for all. So which means um, if any of these processes crashes, the supervisor terminates all other processes and then starts everything from start because um, with this message passing, free-flowing message passing, actually there might be a more optimized way, but I didn't find it yet. You can have nested applications, so you can nest applications in application, then you can like transform it to a supervisor tree maybe. But currently it's like if anything goes wrong here or the monitor crashes, for example, um, for reasons we will soon see, um, then everything gets restarted. So we have a lot of colorful errors here. So the violet errors are just a supervision tree. And let's start with the red ones. So what happens here? I, I only drew half of the stuff. You have to think it's symmetric. So the other side does the same, but then it would be even more confusing. Um, so let's look at this. What, what happens when they start up? They register their function blocks because the function blocks have names. The, the, the function blocks have instances. You can have more instances of one function block, so they are named. And currently, I'm just using Allen's global registry. Um, this will not stay this uh, like this because the global registry has issues, especially if you have like more than 100 nodes, and we don't have that much um, computation power. So we, I'm, I'm maybe, maybe I'm talking a little bit later when, when there's still time. There's there's other ways to do distribution with Erlang and, and, uh, and other registry registries with courses. But for the first version, we just use the global registry. Global registry means that um, on every node there runs a global module and they exchange the name. And if you register a name, it's globally registered in the whole tree. And there is basically a collision detection. If a collision happens, um, then you can it, it either shoots one or you can like have pass a function that gets called, um, and then you can decide which one has to go away. Um, in our um, use, uh, use case, it can't, this can't happen because we actually, we actually generate all these tables, and we know exactly um, which process is on which node. And we know exactly which names exist, so we know there is no duplicate function block name. So that's just for the first thing. So when they start up, they actually don't start through. They only start halfway and register their name. And then they wait for a start signal. So actually, now let's start. And that's where the, the, the monitor comes in. Um, so next, let's look at the yellow things, and, uh, or no, uh, the, the orange ones. Yeah, from red to orange. The monitor actually waits if everything is registered. It waits for its own processes to be registered, 
because some, some process could be slow. And it also waits for those processes, for the other nodes to be registered in global. So when the monitor sees all the, the, the names it expects, then it sends start messages to all the function blocks. And then the actual action starts. So th this is the startup. So the, with this, we can handle like if we start up one node and the other node isn't there and we can't run. And what happens if you split the net or one node goes down? The, the monitor is called monitor for a reason because it monitors all the function blocks on all other nodes. Not the local ones because my, our own supervisor takes care of this. But it monitors all the other the, the remote uh, nodes and the remote function blocks. And if any one of those goes, which we will find out after a while, not very fast, it's very slow actually, but this is tunable, um, then the monitor crashes itself. Because half of the application is not reachable anymore, so it crashes itself. And what I put in addition there, that you can have multiple, PL uh, multiple PLC applications per node, and you can have a fallback application. So you can have a fallback application that only uses local I.O. Because the main thing why we want to distribute it is we want to use the I.O. of the other nodes. So we, we conserve I.O. sensors and egg trackers and everything. So it, the, the whole thing gets cheaper. That's all. We want to save money. And <clears throat> so you can have a fallback application um, which, um, which then does some like emergency program. So this looks like demo time. That's what I have on the table for those who can't see it. Um, so we have two nodes here. These are embedded boards running Artems and Erlang. They are connected with, with Ethernet. This is industrial Ethernet. So you see it's like it's a little bit like the, the, the tail wagging with the dog. It's just little boards, but normally it's like, yeah, it's very robust. And wired to these, these boards are some actual actuators. LEDs, and actually we also have a sensor. This is one of those inductive uh, metal detecting sensors. So when metal goes, comes close, um, it, uh, it, the signal goes to one. And, and you see every node has its own actuators and sensors and they are networked together. So let's start them up. So normally this, this startup goes in like three seconds, but uh, and if I have network with six seconds, but we log a lot. And currently the serial console is still on and it's um, synchronous because it's only used for debugging. And so we need to wait until all the, all the log messages are output over the not connected serial console. Yeah, so it starts up in red. Let's be safe. Five seconds and then one of the traffic lights gets green. So that's actually traffic lights, by the way. And so since we have traffic lights, we need cars. So this one has green, so this one can go through. Nothing changes. But if you, if, if no traffic is over there, and somebody comes here to the sensor and stands on the red light, to trigger right, then he gets green and can go. And if you have traffic at both sides, then it does like interchange. Everybody can go a little bit. So, cl classic sensor um, traffic light. Um, so, what happens if the network goes down? <coughs> Let's make it go down. Let's split. So, the first thing you see, we go to red. Both get red. This is actually in the application. So, in the in the traffic light application. Uh, I built it fail safe, so it, it, it needs a, a, a signal from the other side to go from red to green. And um, so it, it, it always gets stuck at red um, if, if, if the other side just disappears. So this, this now takes a while um, because um, the LM distribution sends, uh, the, if you don't tune it, it sends every, I think every 15 seconds it sends a message to the, a ping message to the other node. And if it misses four ping messages, at least, or four or five pin messages, I don't know. Um, then it detects the other node is gone. And so this is the time it takes until the fallback application. Then, then, then our main application crashes. Now we are still in the main application. The main application crashes and the fallback uh, comes on. A minute. It's about to have to. Uh, it worked before. <laughs> 
So, yeah, we have still a lot of time, so we wait for it. <laughs> yeah, it crashed. So this is the fallback application. It's actually a different PLC application which doesn't use sensors. And it's actually that the thing that does that the traffic light would do, like yellow blinking. Be careful. And so what actually happens now is that the main application crashed and gets restarted again, and restarts all the blocks and then waits in the monitor until the other side appears again. So the appearance goes much faster than the disappearance. The disappearance can be sped up if you, if you, you can have the tick time increased uh, of error distribution, but then you get into a mess when you have lots of nodes because then you have lots of traffic just for pinging. And, uh, but there are ways around this. this. I just kept it simple at the moment. So let's plug it back in and see what happens. So it's, it starts in red, so not everybody drives. And we have the first crash, and well, it works again. And yeah, I've run it for like quite a while now. Ah, actually, before I talk about hard real time, I actually would like to show you some code since there's enough time. Um, so this is the actual the actual code that move this away. That's the actual code that implements the traffic light. Can you read it? Is it readable, or should I increase the font? Okay. So we have, um, like, similar to the world, we have some event inputs and event outputs, and we have like uh, outputs for for the for the for the actuators for the colors for the lights. Uh, there's also a, a delay output which goes into a delay. This delay block we saw, which we can't have in in here. There's no delay in the state machine. You need an external delay block, looping back to the input like the. The wait, the wait event basically triggers the delay, sets the amount of delay we want to wait. So we only need one delay block because we can change the actual time we, we want to wait. And then we get, can get back, the, the, the delay block gets back to us with the next event. So we, we get through the states um, automatically. Then we have the input variables, which is the, the time um, the yellow light stays on and the time the green uh, light stays on. That's actually configurable or like can be adopted to the traffic amount. If you have lots of traffic, you have shorter intervals, and if less traffic, you have longer intervals. Would actually work. Um, and then there, there, there is a, a yield signal, which is basically the, the, the sensor from the, other, from the other side, that the other side is saying, hey, I, I also want to have the crossroads. And so let's draw this up a little bit. Um, there are the states. You see, you can have. This is more complex now. You can have um, multiple X output events. So every time uh, we change something, we, we send a set event, which actually sets the, the lights in the IOs, because we need an event to actually set the, the value. The wait event is triggered whenever we want to wait. The other event goes, the, the other event goes over the network to the other side. And tells the other side, yeah, you can go green now. I'm red. This is only triggered by the red state. So that's why if we, if we interrupt the, the, the thing, it just stops because the other end doesn't go through anymore until the following application comes uh, running. So then we have the transitions. Um, yeah, it's, you, you can see here, here, here we have basically a, a Boolean transition. There's also a Boolean transition for initialization. It does this always in the beginning. And this is, these are events, triggered by events. And they, the actual algorithms are very simple because we just set the, set the, the lights and the, the, the delay for, for eventual wait. So that's the whole software of the traffic light. By the way, Ampel is a German word for traffic light. It was shorter. Normally I only code in English, but yeah, traffic light. Kind of sucked, this name. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is um, to, to, to show you the other uh, thing. This is where actually the connection goes. The function blocks in the initially that's all the function blocks, blocks we have. So we have we have uh, initialized the function block that gets us the first event in to, to get the, the thing started. Basically, after a switch on, you get one event to get stuff running. And then you have the initial delay. The delay, delay for the initialize. Um, so we wait a little bit until we go from red to changing. So we are five seconds red when we switched on. So 
we, we start from a safe, safe state. And then the Mayo out and uh, Mayo in, that's the actual actuators. That are, those are function blocks who actually map to the IOs on the boards. Um, and um, the sensor is the input, and the, the, in front you see the names. And then we have the function blocks. We have basically these are the, that's the code you just saw. That's the output. And so we have two of those. And each, each one has one delay, which is then loop back. And then you just have the connections. That's kind of boring. And any connections you can have, um, now that's the event connection, that's how the events are connected. And the data connections you can have, uh, also have constant values. That's how you configure the stuff, for example. So a little bit of code I want to show you. Uh, that's actually an uncore code when you print print it. So that's actually the code of the ample after I compiled it. So this is actually algorithm. So that's a case similar. There's still pattern matching. Oh, let me move this away. There's, this is pattern matched, and then you have all the uh, a kind of a row of nested and uh, of nested lets, and yeah, just I, I don't want to go into details here. It's just so you saw it once. So. Um, let me talk a little bit about hard real time as long as I have time. Not much, I know, yeah. Um, so, this is actually running on the airline system, so we have soft real time. There are actually a lot of IO bound and embedded applications where soft real time is uh, sufficient. <coughs> where it's sufficient that in most time are uh, in time. Um, and the actual definition of hard real time is also very interesting because it's, um, that's one of the earliest definitions. It's, it's sufficiently quickly, so not very hard defined. So hard real time is mostly, if, if you miss the deadline, then it's an error. But um, you only can like, promise to have 99% error, or 99.9% um, non uh, I mean, on an error rate different, 1% or 10%, you basically, you always have a probability that it fails because the hardware can fail. So hard real time is not always you will ever, ever get the deadline. So soft real time is a new hard real time. No, we don't want to. Um, we actually plan to get hard real time into the airline system. Um, so I don't want, I, I, I could like compile to C and run it in C and it's actually fast hard real time, but um, that's kind of boring. Um, that's um, that's uh, the, the way um, the LN system running on RTMs is looking right now. You have the LN code, you have the LN runtime. This is the, the RTMs uh, executive, and you can have some C application. And in the LN code, through MIFs and LinkedIn drivers or pod drivers, um, you can actually talk directly to the hardware. Usually, you just talk to the registers because there's no memory protection, you just access everything. Um, so, when we when the, 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 these processes in the LM code, is, uh, they are now soft real time. So when we want to have hard real time, um, we have already a hard real time operating system. So we can we have actually the basics that, uh, that we need. But then we have the second level, basically. So you see that the items we moved over there. And we have the runtime and the normal LM code on the top. And in, 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 the, in the intermediate running on a higher priority, um, we, we are planning to, we're planning, it's all plans. It's not done yet. Um, we are planning to do to run um, a special scheduler for Allen processes, um, which knows about hard real time, which which runs at a higher priority than all the other Allen processes. So they preempt those, and usually, probably only the hard real time stuff then talks to hardware anymore. So how could this work? I mean, Allen is a dynamic uh, garbage collected language. That's kind of doesn't fit really if you think about it. Um, so let's look at a timeline when our uh, airline process runs. You have a time T0 when an uh, event comes in there. The red arrows are messages. You get a message. And then you have um, one deadline, or we will have one deadline, um, which is basically a deadline when we have to do all the actions. Then we need to have all the I.O. actions and send all the messages out going and everything. And then we have the, uh, the blue arrow. We have the recovery time. It's a second deadline. That's a deadline until when we are ready to get the next message. And that's where we show the garbage collection. And then you need to like, show that um, 
statically show if you have the whole communication network, you can uh, possibly with some limitations if you you can use full Erlang, but you have to limit yourself a little bit, like memory wise and stuff like this. Um, then you can uh, think. There you see two processes. Um, it's a earliest deadline, first scheduler. So the whoever has the next deadline is the highest priority. So the, the green action of, of the of this deadline runs first, and then the garbage collection can happen. Actually, the, the, the recovery time that's actually translatable relatively easily to something the user understands. That's actually a message rate. The maximum message rate the system can take. So how, 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 how do we want to do this? We have uh, fixed two-part heaps. So we allocate, <coughs> we allocate the heaps in the beginning. Um, we don't increase them. That's memory get. And we have two, two parts of the heap, two, two, two copies of the heap. So we can reuse the normal um, copying garbage collector of Erlang, which copies between these two heaps. Um, the message mailbox needs also to be fixed size, of course, because growing message mailboxes uh, it's not real time. <laughs> it makes you slower if you have lots of um, uh, messages to match. And you crash on all kinds of errors. You miss a deadline, you crash. You, you're out of memory, you crash. And you can have a very quick restart because you can ju just jump to the beginning. And you don't just reuse your old heap. You just throw away your state and jump to the beginning. And you can do this several times. And have a counter for this in, in an interval. If this doesn't work, then you really crash, and then a supervisor comes in. So yeah, that's the last slide. Um, you can uh, you, you need different message behavior because of the limited size mailbox, and um, I'm actually in favor of implementing all four combinations because um, at least for three, I can I have an immediate uh, application, and one is yeah, let's, let's put it in for symmetry. So you can either crash the sender, that's for example if a normal error process sensors, sensor stuff too fast, then it's his fault, so we crash him. Don't send me so much, crash. Uh, you can crash the receiver because the receiver, the state in the receiver might be corrupt, uh, and, uh, which makes it slow, and so it can't take its message right anymore, so we can crash the receiver. Uh, and then you can not crash anybody, but drop messages. And you can keep the old messages or keep the new messages. For example, temperature sensor, you keep the new messages. Because if you have a new, new temperature, uh, the old temperature is, you don't care about it anymore for like a control loop. And that's this, and, and now we don't have time for questions anymore, probably. <laughs> Only short questions, or talk to me afterwards.